efficiency which is within the ministry but it is substantive one electricity sector is getting more and more uh, agencies which are autonomous and accountable so the creation of a separate accountable and uh, uh, autonomous agency is very important for doing any successful reform in, in any sector apart from the fact that most of these agencies are also staffed with specialized agents not not run of the mill bureaucrats they are not excluded from it but if some bureaucrat some is officer has to be in the in the field of education he has certain amount of experience of it he has certain amount of commitment to it that makes the situation uh, much less difficult these are the two important things i learned from that book uh, those who are interested can read that book and get some more knowledge uh, thank you very much thank you very much everyone uh, now we have uh, some time for uh, two questions maybe if uh, audience has sir may may, may I request uh, your introduction tafulla chaudhry i am from bangladesh indian doctors are absent only 36% bangladeshi doctors in rural areas are absent over 70% this is the document produced by world bank and the bangladesh government herself <coughs> and the bangladeshi uh, the inspectors are so smart uh, whenever there is an inspection team uh, there is a leave of application is ready so they put it sir he is on leave today so it is a collusion between the civil surgeons inspectors and other another thing is this all the <coughs> All, all, all the technological solution that you have proposed, I am very disappointed. <coughs> technological solution will not improve the health of the of the in, in rural areas. Has the health secretary will he be happy to go to check the monthly attendance of the absentee doctors, or he will be more happy to sign an agreement with the World Bank? and have a visit to washington i leave it with you to decide you see the corruption in the health sector with the great involvement of the world bank has increased tremendously more money has been poured into the health sector education sector more corruption has emerged especially in bangladesh and i'm sure there is a no reason why the same trend will not follow in pakistan or india yesterday we have heard the social audit is not functioning because no action has been taken similarly similar situation exists in other you see for this problem i think international agencies to some extent to a greatly to be blamed you see <coughs> in this part of the world pakistan india and all the south east asia over 70% of the all deliveries occurs at home as at home home deliveries if i take the more specific in bangladesh almost 4 million births occur every year of which <coughs> over 3.5 million births at home what is the infant mortality uh, what is the maternal mortality about 10000 a year where do they die in the hospitals in institution where who unicef and all other agencies are pushing we have seen in the paper the doctors are absent but more deliveries are occurring not in the government hospital in the private and in india more than carefully india government is helping the privatization of the healthcare privatization of childbirth it is a simple process physiological process you have converted into a technological once it come to a hospital it turn into a cesarean section in bangladesh if you take the case we don't <coughs> we don't pay for the cesarean like india government is paying even then 10000 deaths that occur it is over 7500 occurred in the hospital because doctors are absent anesthetists are absent but they are absent in the government hospital but they are present in some private clinic so that is the where the probably uh, 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 Professor Ghosh was telling 
you have to radical you have to think of it in a very completely different way i am very disappointed you have all the time talking about the central recruitment in the provincial government recruitment why not by the local government think something idc should think of how we can strengthen the local authority more power could be given to the local authority once the local authority been strengthened especially elected local authorities with some accountability i'm sure there will be improvement in healthcare i and incentives and rewards i want to end my talk all the doctors and others should be recruited locally not by the provincial government by the district authority or local authority secondly rewards and incentive not by salaries you see medical profession they are the elite of the society they come from a uh, upper classes they always want to climb up so for them a post graduate education is more important so anybody who would spend 2 to 3 years in the rural areas diligently honestly should be given the preference to enter into post graduate i think that sort of system might have a better result thank you thank you very much this is indeed uh, very thoughtful of you to say that uh, last question please from this yeah, side i'll, I'll be it, it's kind of a comment and a question which applies to a number of uh, uh, things so i won't mention individually one you know in number of things i have seen over the last two days you know we are focusing on individual incentives versus system, systemic uh, reform and the problem is this you know if 20% of the people in a system are corrupt the individual things can work my estimate of corruption in indian system is like over 80% you cannot solve a systemic problem by individual uh, incentives now uh, two examples uh, uh, which from your you know 25 years ago my di uh, my wife did medical education there used to be compulsory posting to rural areas nobody wanted to go to the rural areas we are still talking about that but not addressing the actual problem you are still talking about incentives so what is one possible solution i'm just mentioning it because that's the line we have to think one possible solution is e medicine you know it's the critical portion is is diagnostics have a local person kind of combining uh, what uh, uh, he just said that you have a local person for a physical interaction but all the diagnosis is done by somebody sitting in an urban area where he wants to be okay so that's one uh, example the second one uh, uh, is i i think you're on to something this online procurement uh, system uh, but but again th there's a slight this individual versus systemic uh, i wrote a paper in 2006 it's on the planning commission website you know accountability it combines what professor gosh has just said who is it accountable to it has to be the people so what i suggested what was i call a public accountability information system you put it on the internet so that it's available to the public ultimately the only way this principal agent problem can be solved is if the people can see if on the internet it says you did x y z for me and i go out and i don't see it that's the only way to maintain pressure when there is systemic corruption uh, just to finish you know if 80% of the people were not corrupt they'll make sure you know with individual incentive that the 20% do the right thing but when 80% are corrupt i've i've seen that system from inside for 20 years it's very very difficult you know there are only a few people like me who are crazy who keep working you know because that's the only thing we know how to do <laughs> thank you very much for your comprehensive review uh, dr rima wants to respond to this Uh, yeah, so I wanted to respond to a number of the comments. I actually, um, so I agree with um, with all of the comments that were made. That you know, we've been talking about monitoring and incentives for many years, and many governments are continuing to do more monitoring programs to get government workers to show up to work. And I think one of the value of the research is to actually test it in practice. And so, in this case, for example, in the paper that I looked at is very similar to a number of other cases we're seeing in the literature where you can get the monitoring and incentives to work but the sustainability is not there because of broader issues in the system. But then it gets back to the question of I agree that we need to start thinking about more fundamental ways to change the system. But the question is how? Um, what is going to work? What's not going to work? And in that case we want to be thinking now of how can we extend the research to be thinking about how can researchers and governments partner up to think about how do we really evaluate 
more systematic changes to government. And so, for example, I'm very excited to see the results of the paper that Anand was talking about, where you're starting to see the policy or programmer actually trying to physically change the rules and understand if something like that can have a much bigger effect. And so when I see research like that, I'm getting very excited moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This uh, concludes our session. I'm sure it has been an excellent opportunity for every one of us to learn how the government works, what kind of interventions are needed. And the purpose of this session is to discuss among, amongst ourselves and implement these things, the lessons which are learned from these sessions to implement it in your practical life and come out with some better results. Of course, there is no denying fact that the more you devolve, the more you decentralize towards local government, it, the better monitoring there would be. And of course, telemedicine is an, an, another uh, area which is uh, IT based and uh, we are, our health department in Punjab is now trying in uh, one of the Tessils of Kasur, they have already contacted a party from USA and they are going to have a public-private partnership in telemedicine. So that's what is uh, the future and I'm, I do agree with you with that and I think uh, we should look into those areas as well. Uh, Punjab government has uh, taken many initiatives in their governance reforms that could be, uh, may it be smartphone monitoring, uh, dashboard monitoring for the policy makers, uh, call centers, uh, land record management system where they have their land record now on website to be more open by legislation by the use of IT based uh, programs and few of them have been discussed here and many of them have not been discussed but that will be under discussion in some future uh, sessions with IGC or uh, with other research groups. I am grateful to International Growth, Conf International Growth Center. Uh, the management of International Growth Center for collecting such a galaxy of scholars and uh, uh, people from academia to come here to Lahore and discuss their research, discuss their knowledge, share it with us and I am sure we all are there to gain from these uh, sessions. I uh, thank you very much for the participants, particularly those who have come from outside the city and outside the country. I'm sure you have been looked after well and I wish that your stay here is fruitful and enjoyable. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have a 10 minutes coffee break. After that, we'll start our next session. And uh, just a reminder, in case you haven't filled the feedback form, please fill that before you leave. Head has been a part of a member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee since uh, 2006, um, and he's also an editor of leading journals such as the Economic uh, American Economic Review and the Economic Journal. Um, Professor Besley's talk, in some sense, um, comes sort of on the tail of an interesting discussion, which was about systemic. In I, I, institutional or systemic incentives and the importance of those incentives in triggering uh, development. Um, and in particular, this talk will focus on political institutions. Um, and I think this is a, a really important area. Um, it's an area that's difficult to research because political institutional reform is difficult to come about, as, as, as the discussants from the last session were saying. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that we are having a very um, uh, sort of specific uh, a talk on this. Um, the way it was supposed to work uh, was that we, we're going to uh, show you a recorded lecture, which was supposed to be followed by a Q&A session on Skype. Uh, but we're having sort of some difficulties at that end. So at the end of the lecture, we'll know whether he'll be available on the Q&A or not. Uh, but I think rather than waste time waiting for that, we'll just move on to the lecture. Thanks. Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about political institutions and government effectiveness. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, outline what I regard to be some of the major issues in, in the research program I've been engaged in, but also relating it to the larger research program that IGC is involved in, in particular in relation to its work on state effectiveness. Um, so 
What I want to talk about really are uh, political institutions, um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to try and steer away a little bit from the conventional way of looking at this, uh, which is contrasting democratic institutions and autocratic institutions. Um, my preference, my strong preference, is to look at it through thinking about two kinds of political institutions uh, and why they matter. The first. Hello. Can you see me? Uh, we can't see you, Tim, but we can hear you. Okay. Uh, the only thing is I've got five minutes, so I have to go. Oh, okay. Um, so so I'm not quick... sure this makes a lot of sense at this point. <laughs> right. Um, I'd, I'd expected this all to be about an hour ago. Uh, yes, we're running late uh, at this end. Um, so we um, can perhaps take a couple of questions uh, that you can respond to. Okay. Can you see okay. me now? Yes, yes. In my beautiful LSE office. Yes. Um, so questions. Um, there's one at the back. Be fine. Yeah. But I'll, right. I'll shout if I can't hear the questioner, but but let, let's assume I can. I'm Nazia Malik, assistant professor at Department of Government and Public Policy, NAST. Uh, well, you have really uh, rightly identified about the incentives and. Um, the architecture of the government, especially uh, in the context of Pakistan, the decentralization and then the institutional uh, structure there. Well, my fear in terms of this decentralization effort, 18th Amendment and the NFC award is that, that in case of Pakistan, initially the NFC was, as all of us know, that it was a single factor formula based uh, division of the divisible pool. Uh, now it has been a multi factor uh, formula into it, and then one of the initial factor was only population for uh, fiscal, uh, you can say, uh, sh sharing of that divisible pool of uh, revenues. Now uh, some of the other factors have also been included, other than the population that are like poverty, backwardness, and inverse population density, and something else. My question is that, that uh, even now, what would be the incentive for the federal government when um, to uh, spend a lot of money onto the tax collection side, collectiveness side, when they see that there isn't something like the money that they are being collecting is that, and most of it is going to the provinces, whereas provinces are not giving their effort in terms of generating and collecting the taxes because there isn't something a factor called tax effort or collection side into the NFC thing okay. itself. Okay. Uh, uh, um, so and the uh, second is about the uh, centralization infrastructure. Even after the implementation of that 18th amendment, some of the subjects that has been given to the provinces, there isn't any institutional capacity in terms of the provinces there. And the competitive index that through which we can monitor the performance of all the provinces, my fear is that that one province may be doing better into okay. it, whereas the other provinces may lag behind into it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop you there, actually. Um, so, so let me, this is huge reassignment of federic, federal expenditure down to the provinces and the tax assignment remains centralized so uh, I guess the questionnaire were asking what kind of incentives would that create and her second point was that expenditure reassignment has happened in a context where some of the smaller provinces particularly lack delivery capacity so uh, on the, the let me start with the issue should I Try and respond. This is a good time. Please, yeah. Um, I, I mean, the, the the broader question of the assignment of tax and spending powers, it, it, you know, that that's actually a big debate in a lot of countries, and I'm not surprised that that's a major issue in in Pakistan because the sort of the the the, the capacity of the central government to collect taxes will will always be stronger than the, I think the capacity of local governments. Um, the kinds of tax bases which it makes sense to assign to local governments are quite limited. They would include things like property taxes. Of course, where you have a, a sort of an intermediate federal layer, you can, as for example in the US, have some amount of income taxation at the state level and you can have some amount of corporate taxation, but by and large, the lion's share of taxation, even in rather decentralized systems of government, tends to be federal. So uh, that raises a couple of issues. One is 
the apportionment of, and, and the design of spending rules to allocate that across jurisdictions, which is always a point of contention. Um, I tend to favor more rules-based than discretionary systems because discretionary systems have a habit of misbehaving, uh, particularly in the context of uh, federal electoral cycles, but you know we could have that debate. But the other dilemma that creates is how much accountability can you have just based on spending at the more local level? And uh, again, federal systems tend to grapple with that issue. If the marginal rupee, dollar, whatever currency you want to look at is raised locally, that does tend to sharpen accountability. Um, so there is a strong case for having at least some kind of well-defined local tax base where on the margin there is an attempt to achieve accountability on that. But you have to have that combined with a recognition, I think, that, the, the, that, that it makes a lot of sense to focus on building centralized uh, fiscal capacity. Uh, um, and and, and I, I figure that that's got to be a priority in, in Pakistan, but we're in a workable framework of rules with a, with a, with a system of grants um, to pass the money down. Um, I don't know what the obvious local tax bases are in Pakistan. I'm guessing in most countries it's some form of property taxation, uh, and that clearly is a form of fiscal capacity that has to be built in a, in a transparent and sensible way in Pakistan. So I'll take Dr. Zafar Chaudhary. He, he came first. <coughs> Dr. Chaudhary, I am from Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Timothy, are you promoting and preferring an effective autocratic government rather than an ineffective democratic government? Secondly, in so I hear that, but you're, get, you're going to relay that to me, I assume. Um, I, I can do that, actually. Uh, He's saying, are you uh, promoting uh, and preferring um, autocratic effective government to an ineffective democratic government but he has a second part a to second this. second part is in the role of autonomous institution I didn't find election commission so it seems that you are promoting military governments or some sorts of autocratic government. Thank you. Um, the second question is about uh, putting emphasis on election commissions and he felt that was an omission um, in, in, in the stuff that you put up on the slides. Okay. Well, you should be pleased I have a deadline because I could talk for ages about this. Um, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating autocratic government. I do think, and I, I don't remember whether I said this in my remarks, which I made a record about a week ago, but let me say what I believe. Um, the, 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 the sort of debate looking at the axis of autocracy versus democracy obscures often much more than it uh, it it, uh, it casts light on. I mean, the the, the key point is is whether whether um, there is there are suitable checks and balances and accountability in the way government operates, and we should be focusing on in any system of government how that system of accountability can be fashioned. So, if you look like a, com a country like China, which would would be regarded as totally autocratic on pretty much uh, any standard indicator. You can, and, and you don't have to dig too deeply before you see systems of accountability in the way that government operates. They're not standard forms of accountability, which we're used to in democracies, which are elections and other things. But I don't know of any system of government that hasn't built systems of accountability that can work in the public interest over any period of time. Now. Uh, that doesn't make me in favor of autocratic government. It makes me in favor of checks and balances, transparency, um, and uh, systems of accountability. Um, um, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to say uh, that one should. One should map those into some simplistic uh, notion of democracy or autocracy. On the second point, um, I, 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 my, my uh, particular one of the reasons I don't like the autocracy democracy label is when most people say democracy they immediately think elections. And the elections are important. They're important because they choose our ruling class and they hold our ruling class to account. Um, but, uh, and, but when it comes to building an effective system of government, um, if you elect people to uh, a, a position in which um, they have uh, too much uh, un un unaccountable power, that's not going to solve any of your problems. And actually, election commissions often play a role in certifying that there is a system of free and fair selection. 
um, but, but it only works as a part of a system in which all of the other components, as I say, the checks and balances and the transparency are in place. Um, so, of course, election com commissions and electoral systems are important, but they're only important as part of a system. And if you look at cases where democracy has failed to achieve anything, or not enough at least, there are going to be cases where there was too much focus often on elections and insufficient focus on what you do about making the guys who hold power accountable. Okay, there are two more questions here, Tim. Do you have time? Um, and yeah, I will go in yeah. like fi five minutes. Uh, that, okay. That's fine. I've so got a meeting at 12.30. Uh, he's first and then we'll end with Tim, uh, while democracy, while democracy is getting strengthened uh, all over the world and especially in Asia, but uh, we are seeing a very in interesting thing of a family oligarchy taking over the democratic system. The, will you please comment how it is contradictory? The contradictions by democracy deepening in different parts of the world and coexisting with family oligarchies capturing the democratic space. So, funny enough, I've actually looked at this question in a, in a research paper only from a sort of limited perspective, and that's looking at democratic leaders rather than looking at the, you know, it's quite difficult to get much more data. But let me tell you a fact that, 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 that comes out of that exercise, at least, and I suspect would be mirrored if you looked um, more generally in the political system, and that's that st statistically there isn't much difference between democracies and autocracies as they're normally classified and whether or not you have uh, leaders who come from political dynasties. And uh, you only have to think the US and the, the Bush dynasty uh, would be an example, but actually it runs much deeper than that. Um, if you look in Britain or any other so-called established democracy, you're actually going to find that there's quite a lot of representation of um, political dynasties within the systems of government, people who have direct relatives who served in political office. So it's actually quite common across all systems of, of government. Now, the, of course, that's, that doesn't get to the interesting question, which I'm sure is motivating why, why you ask this. Is it, is it something that we should think is, is, is damaging? Well, again, I would come to the point I made in response to the previous, um, the previous speaker. I mean, I think to some extent it's a bit of a sideshow. I mean, it matters only if you don't have in place the kinds of, as I say, accountable checks and balances that you need. Now, it could be compromising, though, to political selection, um, meaning that if it's the case that as long as you come from the right sort of political dynasty, you can get into public office, it's pretty unlikely you're going to be selecting the political class on the basis of ability and even public spiritedness um, that you might want. So. I think it's at least something I would take seriously when looking at issues of political selection. On the other hand, I, I, I still think that if the system of government, um, the reason why I mean, we worry about this less established democracies, is there are other forms of, uh, of institutional arrangement that achieve accountability and they should be the main focus for what we, what we care about. Okay, the last question. Uh, thank you. I'm Mari Oi. I'm the IGC country economist for Myanmar. So you can imagine this debate is highly relevant to our work. Um, I was wondering if you had any comments on for IGC on the role and type of evidence and research most useful during these brief periods of institutional change, as opposed to in a situation like India's, um, where policymakers may be more interested in tweaking um, the best version of an existing policy. Thank you. Okay, uh, I wish I was there uh, with, with you to, to have a long debate about this question about the, the, na the nature of evidence. Let me, let me um, um, make one, one comment on this, which I think um, it's probably a universal comment, but I, I, you know, I'll, I'll phrase it in the form of the, the issues that I was dealing with in, in my talk. Unless, unless we are willing to or able to say something about the mechanisms that under, underpin evidence, it's pretty impossible to project that evidence in a useful way into different contexts. Um, so, so let me let me give you a, a, an example from my own uh, personal history. I was uh, actually a policymaker during the onset of the global financial crisis, and actually through the first phases of the financial crisis, and we we were 
we were doing something very narrow. We were trying to design monetary policy, um, but but in in the face of what we now know was one of the biggest shocks to hit in the in recent uh, history. And of course, um, you could you could think of all sorts of ways you might want to look for evidence. You can go back and pour over historical data from the Great Depression. You can you can do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the only way to get inside the kinds of policies which would be a good response to this was to try and take a stance on what the underlying economic mechanisms are that are at work and the relative empirical magnitudes of those different components. So actually I view that the whole challenge right now in, in, in political economy um, is, is trying to get some established view about mechanisms. And the two sort of broad sets of mechanisms are going to be the mechanisms that surround the process of political selection um, and the mechanisms that surround the kinds of incentives that we present policymakers with. Once we understand them as mechanisms, we can then begin to think of their comparative empirical strength in different contexts. And one idea, again, I'll just uh, wrap up on this, that comes out of my experience in policy was that, the, the, and, and this, this is an idea actually that's been developed in monetary policy but hasn't been developed in the political economy literature, although it's an area I'm working on, is we need to think in terms of what you might call robust policy prescriptions. It's no good making policy prescriptions on the basis of, of empirical evidence that's highly contingent. Um, if we did, since we don't really know the true model, we're almost certain to be offering poor advice. And so we, what we need to look for in the data are things that seem to work under a broad range of conditions. And this is something that Tom Sargent and uh, Lars Hansen have worked on in the context of monetary policy. Because without that, we as policymakers, I think, or we as policy advisors, not policy makers in this context, are, are risking peddling a kind of false precision. Um, and the kinds of policy tests we should use. Now, Chuck Mansky, who's a very interesting, in my view, empirical economist, has been trying to push this idea in the context of robust policy advice based on microdata um, and, and the extent to which you look at bounds as opposed to just trying to push specific point estimates. But I think, I think there are, the question of how you frame what the lessons are from policy is something we still have quite a bit to learn about. Um, and I, you know, I thought if I was there longer with you, I could share some thoughts 